Hello, my name is Koshik Ray. I'm Professor of Public Health at and Cardiologist at Imperial College London. And I had the pleasure of writing a commentary with my uh, co-author, Dr. Julia Brantz, on the 2025 ACC AHA Acute Coronary Syndrome Guidelines with a focus on the, uh, on the lipid portion. And what I'm going to try and do over the next five minutes is really give you an, an update on the maturation of these guidelines compared to previous guidelines, but also hopefully help you work out how to try and implement this into your clinical practice. So firstly, what's new? Well, historically, treatments have just really focused on statin therapy with, if you like, that treatment threshold of 70 milligrams per deciliter guiding intensification of non-statin add-on therapies. And what's changed, I think, in, in the guidance is the evidence around moving towards combination therapies is further described. We've had trials such as Improve It. We've had PCSK9 therapies being added in as well with patients with recent acute coronary syndromes or, or myocardial infarction included. And we've had trials of therapies like bempedoic acid showing that LDL lowering by any means uh, really translates into reductions in, in clinical events. Instead of just thinking about LDL as the, the trigger that above 70 milligrams per deciliter, we know there are a lot of people by the time they have their acute coronary syndrome, they have a lot of plaque, they have a high event rate, and Often in these people, even when you're in this sort of mid-range, if you will, of an LDL between 55 to 69 milligrams per deciliter, if you've got additional high-risk features such as diabetes, polyvascular disease, elevated lipoprotein A, or suspected familial hypercholesterolemia, often these people are getting missed in terms of intensifying treatment. So what's actually quite nice is that recognition that with these, if you like, additional comorbidities or high-risk features, that those patients with an LDL of between 55 and 69, we should be using risk and not just that LDL window to further trigger intensification of therapy. So that's very important. We've got data also now from trials like Racing and Lodestar that has shown that the same LDL achieved with a single drug or two drugs, the LDL is the same, the outcomes are the same. Now, the challenges with any set of guidelines is that they tend to rank them by level of evidence. And there's no real clear pathway of how we put all of this into clinical practice. This clearly, although it's not explicitly said, in the post-ACS patients, we should be trying to get our patients below about 55 milligrams per deciliter. About 70% of patients that present with an acute coronary syndrome myocardial infarction are lipid lowering treatment naive. And even when we offer patients statin therapy, about 80% of patients will not be able, even on a high intensity statin, achieve LDLs below 55 milligrams per deciliter without the use of combination therapy. So how should the doctor try and put all of that into practice? Well, if you think about the, the care pathway, there's information we have on our patients before they hit the ER door. Did they have a history of diabetes? Did they have a history of polyvascular disease? Were they on prior lipid lowering treatment? And despite that, they've had an acute coronary syndrome. So these are all things that, that we can glean quite a lot of information on that guide our, uh, our next steps in our treatment approach. And we can reinforce that with for example, laboratory tests and blood draws like an LDL cholesterol when they come into hospital, a lipoprotein A measurement, so an independent risk factor, apolipoprotein B. And what we can do is integrate those two things. And I can give you four cases. So, for example, if you had a patient who is lipid lowering treatment naive prior to coming in with that ACS, we should be able to get about 40% of our patients to below that 55 mg per deciliter if we initiate high intensity statins and azetamide prior to discharge. And what we can do is during that post cardiac care uh, admission, during follow up, 
measure their lipids, and if they're between 55 to 69 milligrams per deciliter and they've got those high risk characteristics that I described earlier, we can think about adding in a third agent, which could be a PCSK9 directed therapy or benpidoic acid, with probably PCSK9 directed therapies giving you a bigger uh, benefit. But there's obviously that has to be taken into consideration in terms of availability, cost, etc. There may be patients who come in and hit the door on statin monotherapy, and we want to basically add in at least as ezetimibe before they are discharged. They've come in on a statin, uh, or they've had an ACS despite being on a statin. We want to make sure that dose is a high intensity and ezetimibe is added, and we can follow that same pathway. There are going to be some people that are going to be treatment naive, and the reason they're going to be treatment naive, not because nobody's ever tried a statin, but for some reason, they've not been able to tolerate a statin and no alternative has ever been provided. So these are people that should probably go out of hospital with a combination of, of benpidoic acid and azetamide because we want to enhance LDL receptor production. And again, we want to follow these people up early in cardiac rehabilitation to see if their LDL is below 55. If it's above 70, you certainly intensify using that LDL as a trigger. For their LDLs between 55 to 69, you again look for those high risk features. And if they are present, then the next step is to think about one of the injectable therapies targeted at PCSK9. And there may be patients who come in on combination lipid lowering therapy, and they've still had a, an ACS event. So they're already on a couple of drugs and their LDL essentially uh, it has not protected them against a further acute coronary syndrome or, or, or uh, progression of disease. And again, we go through that same pathway. Is your LDL above 70? If so, that's an obvious thing then to think about in terms of adding in an injectable therapy. If you're in that mid range of 55 to 69, then look for risk enhancing features and think about additional therapy uh, depending upon whether those are present or not. And the final part is if you actually get those patients to goal with any of these approaches, then we know that probably we've offset our, our risk as much as possible by, by not only streamlining the pathway using early combination therapy, but also actually having equitable access to outcomes. So I hope you find the accompanying editorial interesting. And I hope that you find the algorithm that we've created, Dr. Brantz and myself, clinically useful and maybe think about having that in your ER or in your hospital units. Thank you for listening.